caveat lector. Reader, beware. We should not judge a book by its title. José Eduardo Agualusa's The Book of Comedians only mentions comedians once, when they are brought up as evidence for an argument that lies are everywhere. Even nature herself lies. What is camouflage, for instance, but a lie? The chameleon disguises itself as a leaf in order to deceive a poor butterfly. We might then say that the title itself is appropriately comedianesque, in that it is a little deceptive, has a touch of false description. In many ways, this is not a book of comedians, and those who open it, expecting it to be so, will be disappointed, although it does feature a lizard as one of its central characters, also its first-person narrator. But that lizard is a gecko, not a chameleon. Once we realize this, we may wonder what other deceptions or tricks the book has in store for us. What else in it is not quite what it seems. The novel's title, moreover, is an artifact of translation. The Portuguese original literally means the seller of pasts. So maybe this too is appropriate, that the book's past life in its original language has been gently erased and replaced in its rebirth for an English-speaking readership. The translator, Daniel Hahn, justifies the revised title, which, he explains, was a joint decision made with the author, Agualusa, on the basis that, at its heart, this is a book about a number of characters whose personalities, whose stories, keep shifting from moment to moment, whose true personalities and stories are impossible to pin down. Again, perhaps, it is apt that the story shifts yet again, as it moves into a new language. After all, in English it is now a book of chameleons, and its new title may lead us to read it slightly differently. New language, new book. For there are, once again, appropriately, at least two ways of thinking about the doubleness and duplicity that, as critics Rita Maria Knopp and Virginia Cavallo de Assis Costa observe, are indelibly inscribed in the novel. On the one hand, we could think about them in terms of treacherous mendacity and deception, as with the example of the chameleon that Agualusa provides. He lies to the butterfly, saying, Don't worry, my dear. Can't you see? I'm just a very green leaf, waving in the breeze. And then he jets out his tongue at 625 centimeters a second and eats it. Here, the dissimulation is a trick or a trap designed to put, off, put us off our guard and make us easy prey for the ruthless hunter. We should therefore always beware that the real thing still lurks behind the mask. On the other hand, however, we might think about the ways in which dissimulation also creates something new that, as with the translated novel, has its own reality, a life of its own. As Agualusa himself notes about the process of rendering his own novels into other languages, to a great extent, every translation is a recreation. This isn't something that bothers me, rather the contrary. In fact, there may be times at which we cannot easily distinguish between the original and the copy, or when the double comes to be more lifelike more real than the thing 
on which it is modelled. Fittingly, perhaps, this novel cannot quite decide between these two conceptions of doubleness. For much of the time, in part in homage to the Argentine writer Jorge Luis Borges, to whom Agualusa tells us the book is a tribute, it suggests that a mask can have as much as, if not more, reality than what it masks. But its somewhat surprising and violent denouement indicates by contrast that beneath it all, things stay the same. A leopard cannot change its spots. A tiger, gecko, cannot change its stripes. In the end, the book seems to conclude, the truth will catch up with us, as we can never escape our pasts. Let us start by listing at least some of the instances of doubleness found in this novel. What examples can you see of duplication, masking, mirroring, reinvention, and the like? How do the themes of duplicity and dissimulation play out in the book? Pause the video and write down as many examples as you can. While you do that, I'll have a glass of papaya juice. But I'll be right back. The Book of Chameleons has two main characters who share the same house in Luanda, Angola's capital city. The first, Felix Ventura, has two jobs, one open and legal, and the other clandestine. He is a collector and dealer of second-hand books on the one hand, and he is a seller of pasts as once again the original Portuguese title has it, on the other, whereby he puts these old books to use, by catering to a whole class, a whole new bourgeoisie, whose futures are secure, but what these people lack is a good past, a distinguished ancestry, diplomas. He sells them a brand new past, by providing them with documents and photographs attesting to a distinguished but invented second genealogy. The house's other inhabitant is a gecko, the book's narrator, unnamed for most of the narrative, who describes Ventura as the creature, as though it were the lizard that were the more human of the two. Indeed, Ventura, who is black, pure black, but albino, and so suffers under the tropical sun, points out similarities between himself and the gecko. You've really got terrible skin, you know that. We must be related. And the gecko, a rare breed, has the singular capacity to make a laughing sound that can be mistaken for human laughter. In fact, he too is double in that he remembers a past life as a man, and in his dreams he once more takes on human form and interacts with Ventura, who likewise dreams of the gecko returned human, and other characters. Sometimes he even wonders if he is a man dreaming that he is a gecko, rather than a gecko dreaming that he's a man. After all, his dreams are almost always more lifelike than reality. It is unclear which is his second life, and which his first. The plot gets going with the arrival of a mysterious foreigner, 
a war photographer who is seeking Ventura's services. What he wants is a little unusual. Not just a new past, but an entirely invented second identity. A new name, with documents to match. After some hesitation, but also a hefty cash advance, Ventura is persuaded to take on the commission, and comes up with the requisite forged documents, in the name of José Buchmann. As always, he establishes for his client a fictitious genealogy and family story. A Boa father, from a place called Chibia, in Angola's rural south, and an American mother, an artist, who abandoned the family when she went to South Africa, and never returned. All well and good. But things start to get peculiar, when Buchmann, to Ventura's astonishment, decides to track down his fictitious parents, and finds, first, his father's grave, and then evidence of his mother's subsequent life, after her flight to Cape Town, a city, he tells us, is like a plastic palm tree, so clean, so tidy, it's a fraud that it suits us to believe in. And on to New York and back. The coup de grace comes when Buchmann returns from South Africa with a painting signed by his mother. Physical proof of the truth of Ventura's false narrative which seems increasingly to be becoming real. The forger is alarmed. He held the watercolour carefully between his fingers, as though he were afraid that the unlikelihood of the object could compromise its solidity. Somehow, his fiction has gained material weight. We may be less surprised about all this, however, if we pick up on clues about the gecko's past life, which include the novel's epigraph, taken from the Argentine writer Jorge Luis Borges. If I were to be born again, I'd like to be something completely different. And there are hints also in the gecko's dreams of himself as a man with a fear of women and sexuality, who would like some day to live in Geneva, that he is, in fact, the reincarnation, as lizard, of Borges. Agualusa confirms this hunch. In my book, Borges is reincarnated in Luanda, in the body of a gecko. The gecko's memories correspond to fragments of Borges's real-life story. Somehow, I wanted to give Borges a second chance and there is perhaps no writer more fascinated than was Borges with the themes of doubleness and duplication. He wrote, for instance, a story, Tlon Ukba Orbis Tertius, about a secret society that, by inserting false entries into encyclopedias, invents first a country and then an entire world physical evidence for whose existence strangely starts appearing in the unlikeliest of places. Knowing this, we may come to see Buchmann's adventures to be a rewriting of Borges. Critic Bernard McGurk notes that Buchmann has the acquired initials of the blind librarian precursor. And start to notice other allusions to the Argentine throughout Agualusa's text. There may even be moments at which, as Borges would put it, and indeed he did, in a story Borges and I, about his own relationship to himself, it is hard to tell which of the two it is that has written a particular page. Just as Ventura is a ghostwriter for a government minister's memoirs, sewing fiction in with reality dexterously, minutely, so Borges is the writerly ghost haunting 
this entire novel. A second writer, behind the first, though the first, of course, comes second. The entire game of doubles, in which the priority of copy over original is thrown into doubt, is quite evidently copied from Agualusa's Argentine precursor. Hence his tribute is at the same time both theft from and repayment, an offering or gift rendered as a duty or as an acknowledgement of affection or esteem, to a writer who has long had a hold on Agualusa's imagination. As the novel progresses, more characters turn up at the strange ship that is Ventura's and the Gecko's abode. As might be expected, they are also doubles in one way or another. Angela Lucia, for instance, her first name just one letter distant from the name of the country in which the novel takes place, is a young woman for whom Ventura has fallen. Like Buchmann, she is a photographer. But whereas he is a photographer of the dark side of human history, from the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan to the Israel-Palestine conflict, she is a photographer of light. I collect light, she tells us. Everything about her is light, claims Ventura. She even seems to have an aversion to the dark. When Buchmann describes his career, Lucia protests, Enough! I don't want your memories to pollute this house with blood. But as the gecko notes, Where there is light, there are shadows too. And shadow or shade is where a gecko hides, seeping, seeking a deeper crack, a deeper damper crack, to keep out of the sun. It is from a kind of crack, a sewer that apparently he'd made his home, that a fourth character emerges. An old man, seemingly a madman, reminiscent of an ancient vengeful god, wild-haired, with suddenly lit up eyes, who turns out to be an ex-agent of the Ministry of State Security, with a life story stranger than fiction. Edmundo Barata dos Reis is a former schoolmate of Ventura's, was later involved in the anti-colonial liberation struggle against the Portuguese, who put him in a concentration camp for trying to establish a bomb-making network in Luanda, and kept the faith with Marxism, even when the post-revolutionary government embraced free-market capitalism. A communist, he calls himself. Would you believe it? I'm the very last communist south of the equator. But his loyalty to the ideology, he has a shirt from the Communist Party of the Soviet Union that he never takes off, leaving a hammer and sickle tattooed on his chest, means that he has fallen out of favour with the Angola's current regime. He lives in hiding in the sewer, as the revolution has betrayed him. Not only is he a double of the post-colonial moment, a reminder of a past that the ruling party, the MPLA, the People's Movement for the Liberation of Angola, permanently in power since independence, would rather have us forget. He also has his own conspiratorial theory of political dissimulation, telling Felix and Angela that the president has been replaced with a double, They've put a double in his place, a scarecrow, I'm not sure how to put it, a fucking replica. This leads Ventura to comment, So we have a fantasy president now. Yes, I'd suspected as much. We have a fantasy government, a fantasy justice system. We have, in other words, a fantasy country. The very land they are living in is an illusion. Both its present and its history, little more than a tall tale, no more real 
in the fake genealogies that the seller of pasts concocts. Suddenly, however, everything changes. Or rather, everything reverts back to the same. In a few fairly frantic pages, it is revealed that much of what we have read has been the effect of a long-planned, hidden plot instigated by Buchmann, who now unveils himself as no longer the Buchmann, but in fact one Pedro Gouveia. A ghost, a demon, exclaims Barata dos Reis. Not a foreigner at all, but a former member of the MPLA who, in 1977, two years after independence, took part in an attempted coup d'etat against the revolution. The coup failed, and the rebels were persecuted. In fact, in the wake of the historical event to which Agualusa alludes, at least 2,000, and perhaps tens of thousands of so-called fractionalists, followers or suspected followers of the former interior minister, Nito Alves, were killed. Baratidos Reis, ultra-loyal agent of state security, the revolution was under threat. There was a band of nobodies, a gang of irresponsible petit bourgeois who tried to seize power. Was one of those charged with restoring order. He interrogated, and no doubt tortured, Gouveia slash Buchmann, delighting in telling him that he had killed his wife, Marta. Marta had been pregnant at the time she was rounded up, and Barata dos Reis also told Gouveia that they had killed the baby, born into custody. But in fact, and if anything worse, they tortured the infant, leaving scars that would persist long into adulthood. Scars that we, or the gecko, have seen already, not knowing what they are, as it turns out that it is Angela who is Gouveia's long-lost daughter. Hearing this story in Ventura's kitchen, with everything now exposed to the light, Angela herself grabs a revolver and shoots Barata dos Reis in the chest, killing him instantly. His dark past has caught up with him at last. We have returned to the chameleon's mode of and raison d'etre for duplicity, as a trap to lull the unwary into false confidence before inflicting a fatal blow. And although such revenge plots are not entirely foreign to Borges, for instance in stories such as Death in the Compass, and perhaps especially Ibn Hakam al-Bokhari, Murdered in his Labyrinth, to a large extent, at this point, the Borgesian playfulness and ambiguity fades in favour of realist explication. Albeit in a dream, and only to the gecko, Buchmann slash Gouveia spells everything out, including how he faked his fictional father's gravestone and passed off someone else's artwork as his mother's painting. His rationale does maintain the other way of thinking of doubleness. I needed Felix himself to believe in my life story. If he believed it, who wouldn't? And today... I honestly believe it myself. I look back now, back into my past, and I see two lives. In one, I was Pedro Gouveia. In another, Jose Buchmann. Pedro Gouveia died. Jose Buchmann returned to Chivia. But there is a sense that some of the experimentation and ambition of the novel has here been betrayed. It is no wonder that after this, his final dream, the gecko slash Borges, promptly dies, killed by his mortal enemy, a scorpion. If not a chameleon, is Gouveia not 
the scorpion, in this piece. But such may be life and death. It may be nice to think we can reinvent ourselves, construct new pasts and precursors, and fiction encourages us in this fantasy. But there are scars that simply will not fade, such as here the national traumas of Angola's troubled birth pangs and lengthy civil war, which began with independence in 1975 and continued off and on for over a quarter of a century leaving something like 800,000 dead and 4 million displaced. Such devastation leaves ghosts that cannot be wished away, whether by the governance embrace of market neoliberalism in the context of an oil boom in which fortunes are to be made, or by ordinary men and women who might hope it had all been a dream. No more illusions. Not everything can be dressed up or denied, or not for long, before the real returns with a vengeance. Music